we're going to start now to build the foundation series. And this is a new, uh, another version of this. And one of the things that I want to be sure that we do is that we, we help you to understand the words that are different. And that's, as we go through training, we have different definitions for things and different words sometimes. And if you have this language, when you listen to the Dhamma talks, you really, really understand them. And it takes you, it allows you to go much deeper in your comprehension, but also it allows you to go much deeper with your practice of meditation. And so we go back to the beginning and look at Siddhartha and say, Siddhartha Gautama was actually attempting to do a precise thing that the ascetics were all attempting to do. They were attempting to open the mind and they were attempting to get to a supernormal uh, mind from a uh, normal mind up to a supernormal mind. There's, uh, I don't know if you know Dr. Punaji or you've heard of Dr. Punaji. But Bhante Punaji, he was teaching three different types of mind, an, an abnormal mind, a normal mind, and a supernormal mind. And we pretty much agree with that, that what's happening in this process, if we're training you properly and you're following instructions very closely, this is the trick to this whole thing. You know, if you're mixing it up with what you know before, it won't work and you'll get disappointed. And after going through thousands of students over the years, watching very closely, the ones that really make progress quickly, clearly, and with full comprehension are those people who follow precisely what the instructions are. So where are the instructions coming from? That's one thing people always want to ask is where are our instructions coming from? They're coming from directly in the texts and it's relying on the text as the primary source, meaning the Pali Canon. And the secondary source could be any of the commentaries, any of them, not just the Sudhimaga, but anything. The Vimudimaga, the Kantatikas uh, that come for each one of the books, you know, like the Majima Nikaya, Samyutta Nikaya, uh, the Digan Nikaya and Gutra Nikaya, they all have, after they were put together and everything, then there were tikas. And the tika means a re-examination of what was said again. That's sort of what the tika means. And you can find these and you work with those to also verify what was said in, in the instructions, especially. Now, you know, over the years, I've thought a lot about this, and some of the things that we say are hard to find, you know, and um, if you were a teacher, I listen, look at what happened to the Buddha. When, when Siddhartha becomes awakened, he makes a decision after a little bit of thinking about this, he ends up making the decision he is going to teach. Teach what? What is he going to teach? So you wonder, what is he going to do with this? Now that he woke up, what is he going to teach and go out and, and teach other people? And it makes perfect sense. He spent six years or more, um, you know, attempting to get through all the way and see this opening happen. He experiences it and he makes a decision. He's going to teach others how to do that. So when we look at him from our school, we say he only had one job his whole life. He only had one job once he's awakened. He's a master meditation teacher, the master of masters meditation teacher. And it's very profound because that's what he's made a decision to do. He's not going to be a prince. He's not going to be an archer. He was super, you know, at all of that. And he's not going to be a statesman. But in teaching the meditation he decides to teach, he turns out to also be known as a master peacemaker. These two things that are happening are extraordinary. 
So not reading the suttas, you're kind of kind of cheating yourself because you don't get to see the stories that happen along the way in the suttas where he settles disputes between villages, between families, between parents and children, and between different kingdoms. And how does he do that? When you really get going with what we're showing you, and you use it to examine what could he have done to solve that problem, you begin to understand he was a master uh, meditation teacher, but he was also a master peacemaker, and he used his meditations training in order to settle these disputes and do reconciliation, peace reconciliation. So this is one of the things that will be covered in this uh, in this series. We'll, we will get to a section on just the Four Noble Truths and look at how it was that he used it, how it was he used those. The very first thing he did with those was he used them as a map for his individual meditation practice. So they became his methodology for practicing meditation. So what do I mean? Okay, if, I'll, I'll take you to that just first and look at this. And as I said, this one is a test today and we're going to, you know, maybe change it around, but we're going to see how far we can go with this one and see if we're, if we're going in the right direction. And I want to take, have plenty of time for you to um, also ask questions in this. Okay. So with the Four Noble Truths, just very quickly, we're going to do it. You have, we don't want to change what they were originally. This is a big thing nowadays. There's lots of books that are out there being written where they change the truths. And when they change them, nobody comes anymore. <laughs> it's pretty, pretty easy to understand. I'll show you how that worked. But the Four Truths, there is suffering. That's the statement. There is suffering. Now, I want to point out. This is an open-ended statement. This sentence is open-ended. It's like an invitation. Come find out what suffering actually is. That's where that went, okay. Second one was there is a cause of suffering. There is a cause of suffering. No further than that. So that's also an invitation. Come and figure out what is the cause of it. This is like a no-brainer. If you broke your bike and you were stuck on the mountain, if you understand how the bicycle works, you can fix it. You can put the chain back on if you understand that. You can fix the tire if you understand that. You can change the tire. If you don't understand how something works, doesn't it make sense? It's going to be very, very difficult to fix it or change it. And this is true. Remember, that's a true thing throughout this whole adventure. And that's why it's so important to understand the pieces in the beginning so they're not like pieces all over the place. That's what someone said to me, but how can you want to study Buddhism? And there's pieces all over the place, complex pieces. But, but what if these are a jigsaw puzzle that can be put together still? What if there's a set of pieces that are key in putting it together so that you can see the whole picture? And, and in this case, you're talking about does this meditation work or does it not work? And the Buddha defined what that meant too along the way. Okay, so first you had there is suffering. The second one, there is a cause of suffering. The third one, there is a cessation of suffering. So this is initially when you look at this, anybody, not, not even a Buddhist can see, yep, I suffer in life. Oh yeah, there's a cause. <laughs> and then have you ever had an experience where you're not suffering in your life? Everybody has had some point somewhere where they had a good birthday party or a happy day or something, and that was the, didn't feel like there was any suffering. So he knew that there was some kind of a cessation, and he wanted to find out if there was a cessation that would last, that he could use in life, not just in meditation. So he's going for that initially. And then, of course, the last one is there is a path to the cessation of suffering. So when we, when we look at these pieces, they're all invitations to find out, uh, invitations to, 
to figure out what exactly is the suffering, the cause of it, the cessation of it. And then is there a way that I can practice in, now we're not talking about, this is another thing. Today, everybody thinks about, about their meditation almost like it's the night we go bowling back in the 50s or 60s. Everybody had a bowling night. <laughs> then when Zen Buddhism came to the United States, everybody had a sitting night just sitting everybody was going to sit because in zen it's cool because they say just sit it's wonderful i did that for six months or so and it's wonderful because that's the directive just sit yeah so every now we have this thing about in looking at today what's going on in meditation around the world and meditation is where's your meditation where do you go for retreat is really the question. When was your last retreat? When did you really meditate deeply? And we have come to this kind of conclusion that might, you have to decide, but it, it might be a little off track, you know, because as a peacemaker, he was trying to teach people something that they could use in their lives all the time, in everything that they did in their life, okay? But if we start thinking that the real meditation is when we go to a retreat, and then when you go home, it's a letdown, isn't it? It's a letdown, and then the hindrances and things that bother you, they all come back in on you during life. And then when you're not sitting with this bunch of other people at the retreat, everything was working. How come it all fell apart sort of when I went home? That's an issue, isn't it? We don't believe that he was trying to find, the retreats were, did not exist. Let's go back a little bit historically. They didn't exist the way they are happening now. It was different. It was all very different. When he was teaching, he's moving around India, you know, and it's like, it's like a bunch of gypsies. <laughs> Only each different monk, the, you know, really famous Arahats, they're teaching a group of people. So you have Sariputta, you have Mogolana, you have Kohita, um, you have um, Anuruddha, okay? And you have several of these others are working with eight different groups of individuals in the camp. And the setup, no matter where they're going, they're working as a group with their teacher. They even had sessions where one teacher came to the other teacher and this group put together questions to ask this teacher from that group. And an example of that is in the questions and answers in 43, um, the, I think it's the, mm -hmm, right, I'm give you the names of these. I'm not always memorizing everything by numbers because that's how we basically did it, us English people here. So in 43, the Mahavidala Sutta, what that is, is greater questions and answers. That one is where Sariputta is giving the answers and Kohita's group, they, they were forming the questions and, and Sariputta's group was giving the answers. So it was really organized. Yeah, and these students we get, when we get the picture in the book and everything, we get the picture uh, as we go through many, many suttas, we get it pretty clear that the students are talking to each other about their practice. Uh, uh, we don't do that today, do we? Most times we'll say don't do that, but actually it's not a bad idea not to say don't do it uh, because you can't find groups of people like you could back then where all the Sotapanas can sit here and talk and then the Sotapanas with fruition and the Sakadagamis and the Sakadagamis with fruition and so forth all the way up to Arahat and fruition. Those groups are the eight groups that were in the camps. I, I'm fascinated with the structure of how this thing worked you know, how, how the meditation school was set up. And along the way, what happened was you, you, when you, what happens to you when you, uh, I know there was a question in one of the suttas in the Anupada Sutta when we're reading about the path, the description of the path. And can we practice the same way that Sariputta did practice? This was Bhante's discovery. We can 
practice the same way as Sariputta was practicing and see what's happening in the first jhana, second jhana, third jhana, fourth jhana. And in infinite space, we can we know there are markers that show us when we're reaching infinite space and infinite consciousness and then nothingness and neither perception or non-perception, but it's the place in the beginning in the, the third and fourth, I think third, fourth jhana, where there's a statement about confidence is something that really comes up strong. And people say, well, what do you mean by that? I've been, I'm practicing for 20 years and I never had a big jump in confidence. What is that about? What are you talking about? Well, think about it. All these students, you know, are, are going down the path for the first time and they were doing the same thing in groups. If I'm in the first jhana, I'm going to talk to somebody else who's in the first jhana and see whether this is happening to them too when they give their description. It, it was like steps of support groups <laughs> going from first jhana, second jhana, third jhana, fourth jhana, infinite space, infinite consciousness, nothingness and neither perception or non-perception. But over time, these things became so obscure, nobody wants to talk about these. You know, they don't want to talk out loud about them. We're, we're in a different level of practice when we go to retreats. It's a little bit different because there's so much out there right now that is going to say, oh, well, these things aren't even possible anymore. We hear that. Or we hear, yeah, we could do it in this lifetime. We could get to soda Pana. We might be able to get to soda Pana. Well, I ran into a contradiction with that. So that you understand where I'm coming from and why I wanted to do the foundation series is because everybody goes and throw, they throw when I was teaching about uh, dependent origination in this uh, university up in Palakeli in, in Sri Lanka at Siba, you know, one monk came up to me afterwards and said, this is really interesting what you're teaching us about the dependent origination, but all we really need is the Satipatthana Sutta. I, I couldn't, I had nothing to say, and they walked away. <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't know what, quite what to say. But the Satipatthana Sutta, I ran into it again. I mean, I, first of all, like Satipatthana Sutta. I believe everything that's being taught about it has to be learned and experienced. I think it's very important that the material in it, that we do learn it in the context that it was meant to be learned in. But the question is, is that what's happening or not right now? Is it what's happening or not? And and the one thing about Satipatthana I ran into was that there was a man and his family came to me in Sri Lanka for some counseling one evening because they were having trouble as a family. The mother, the father, and the two children, one girl and one boy, about 15 and 16 or 17 years old, 15, 17, I think. <clears throat> and they spoke English very well. They could read English fluently. They could speak fairly well, which that's normal. Okay. And um, I said to him after talking to each one of them to find out what the problem was or the challenge for the, in the household, in the home, I said, there's no problem here. And he said, what, what should we do? I said, you need to practice metta together as a family. Metta karuna mudita upeka. You need to do that. But it's the, it's, the, it's the metta and the karuna. It's that level. You need to be practicing metta and karuna. And then he went like this, uh, like that. He said, no, don't tell me that we need to practice meditation, sister. Meditation is, is not going to be the answer. And, and I said, what, what's wrong? And he said, in our temple, now I want to point out the temple was only maybe two or three kilometers away from the university where I was. I was shocked. And the monk at that temple decided to tell those people, don't even bother with meditation in your life. He said, because it could take you a thousand years to accomplish even getting to Sotapanna. Number one, if you were reborn in another era where Buddha information was here, there's a lot of ifs here, you can see that. And But the thing was, he believed that. And I, I didn't want to really upset him or contradict him really hard. And I said, really? So he said, it's not possible to make any of the attainments anymore. That's what we were told at the temple. 
So this, I guess, monk had had any experience sitting in jhana, therefore it can't be done. Is his decision, whether it was his decision or his teacher's or his teacher's teacher's decision, I don't know. But according to him, it wasn't even worth it, according to that monk. But there's a problem with that. And I, again, I didn't want to get him upset. So I said, would you read something if I gave it to you? And he said, he said, what is it? And I said, well, do you know about Satipatthana Sutta? And he looked at me and he said, yes, everybody knows about Satipatthana Sutta. Basically, we know about it. Mm -hmm. And I said, well, have you ever read the last page of the Satipatthana Sutta? And this is really, really important. He said, no, what are you talking about? I said, just the conclusion of the Satipatthana Sutta should tell you something, you know, and he said, well, what is it? I said, here, I'll give it to you. You read it. So I gave it to him and he read it to me. If anyone should develop these four foundations of mindfulness in such a way in seven years, one of two fruits could be expected for him, either final knowledge here and now, and uh, that is an anagami, or if there is a trace of clinging left behind, non-return. Final knowledge is arahat and trace of clinging left behind, non-return. That's your anagami. And so here they're saying that if you, if you do that for seven years, but then I said, keep reading, let alone seven years, if anyone were to develop the four foundations of mindfulness in such a way, in this way, in this way, for six years or five years or four years or three years or two years or one year, one of two fruits would happen, the same thing. Are we, are we following this? Let's keep going. Let alone one year, if anyone should develop the four foundations of mindfulness in such a way for seven months, six months, five, four, three, two, one month, that's four weeks for half a month, that's two weeks. One of two fruits could be expected for him. Well, my teacher, he saw this, you know, and um, he taught us about this last page very, very urgently to remember that we were in 10 day or 14 day retreats. We could get very close to going through and experiencing Nibbana. Now, there's two kinds of Nibbana here. There's a mundane Nibbana, that you will experience, if you are an arahat with fruition, you will experience that eight times. The last time is a super mundane Nibbana. You got that? So it's one time for Sotapanna, one time for Sotapanna and fruition, Sakadagami, Sakadagami fruition, Anagami, Anagami fruition, arahat and arahat and fruition. That's eight times. Something is happening where the taints, um, and the taints are destroyed with wisdom. That's the statement. It's the um, remainderless fading away and cessation of suffering. And it is where the taints were destroyed with wisdom that you need to understand what that all means. You see? <laughs> 